Over the past several Sundays, as we prepared for Discipleship Sunday, on October 31st, we heard several Gospels from the Lord challenging us as disciples in relation to our relationship with possessions and even money. And today, we're probably happy that Jesus isn't talking about possessions or money today in the Gospels. So that means Father won't mention it. But Jesus is talking about something maybe a little more lighter, the end of the time. <laughs> the last judgment. Time and money are related. In fact, we struggle by being possessive of both. We live our lives thinking that our money is our own, and we also think that the time that we have is our own as well. It's a great temptation. And we often say things like, there's not enough time or hours in the day, or there's so little time to do this or to to that. Time is running out. In fact, Jesus is saying in the gospel, yes, time is running out. All things, in fact, are passing away. The temptation with how we are possessive with things and money then relates to time and how we live in relationship with the time of our lives. If we live thinking that our time is our own, then that means that this is the only life that there is. If I live thinking that time belongs to God, then I will live as a disciple. But the temptation to be possessive of our time is something quite known in the struggle of the spiritual life. And this is played out quite well in a creative way in the book, The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis, whereby one devil, Screwtape, is writing his young nephew, Wormwood, who is trying to learn how to be an experienced demon and how to tempt souls away from God and to bring them into damnation. And so Screwtape is writing his young nephew, giving him all of this advice on how to draw a soul away from God. And in one letter, he speaks about using time as temptation. In letter 21, he writes, My dear Wormwood, men are not angered by mere misfortune, but by misfortune conceived as injury. And the sense of injury depends on the feeling that a legitimate claim has been denied. The more claims on life, therefore, that your patient can be induced to make, the more often he will feel injured and, as a result, ill-tempered. Now you will have noticed that nothing throws him into a passion so easily as to find a tract of time which he reckoned on having at his own disposal unexpectedly taken from him. It is the unexpected visitor when he looked forward to a quiet evening or a friend's talkative wife turning up when he looked forward to a -a tete-a-tete with a friend that threw him out of gear. Now, he's not yet so uncharitable or slothful that these demands on his courtesy are in themselves too much for it. They anger him because he regards his time as his own and feels that it is being stolen. You must therefore zealously guard in his mind the curious assumption, my time is my own. Let him have the feeling that he starts each day as the lawful possessor of 24 hours. Let him feel as a grievous tax that portion of this property, which he has to make over to his employers, and as a generous donation, that further portion which he allows to religious duties. But what he must never be permitted to doubt is that the total from which these deductions have been made was, in some mysterious sense, his own personal birthright. The creativeness of C.S. Lewis in these words from the screw tape letters show, in fact, that we struggle with our relationship with time, believing, in fact, that it is our own in which case we know that it's not. But how we approach time is challenged when we look at our approach to death. What is our approach to death? In the pagan world, in the Roman world, in the burial centers, they wrote over many tombs these words, I was not, I was, 
I am not, I don't care. For the pagan, this life is all that there is. In fact, yes, once you're dead, why would you care? But for the Christians in Rome and their tombs in the cemeteries, for the Romans, they called their places of burial necropolises, the city of the dead. Whereas for the Christians, we have cemeteries, places of rest, places of sleeping, awaiting eternal life. Symbolisms in Christian catacombs of the Good Shepherd, or the dove, or the olive branch, or the anchor, which is a sign of hope. The Christian is not dead, he is merely sleeping. Death is not the final say, but rather a point of passage. And so in the month of November, we pray for all the faithful departed throughout the month of November. And as we look to the seasons, we see that as fall is upon us, the days are growing shorter and the nights are growing longer and the leaves are falling off the trees and everything about the season does seem to indicate to us time is running out, the end is near, the end of our secular year is coming to an end. And the end of our liturgical year as a church is coming even more closely to an end. We will begin Advent in two Sundays. And in six Sundays, we will celebrate Christmas. And so if that's unsettling you, you're in the right place. Time is running out. And so in this month of November, it was good for us and our souls, reflecting on the gospel and the readings for this Sunday, to reflect then on four things four certain realities that souls face. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Of those four topics, heaven being the most popular and most easy to listen to, but the other three are certainly hardly even allowed at common dinner conversations to talk about death, judgment, or hell. But the reality is, is that we will face all of these things with great certainty. And so the first thing we realize is that we will find the end of our earthly life, the time will run out for us at our death. You and I most certainly will die. Everyone will die, young or old, single or married, pauper or prince. All of us will face death, most certainly. And then what will happen? Most certainly, judgment the Lord will be, we will be before the Lord as we truly are. Our hearts, our souls will be totally exposed as we truly lived our earthly life. How we spent our time on earth will be fully revealed. Not in a tribunal or big courtroom where he sits as judge with a jury. The only thing judging us is our very own actions as we lived. And in that moment, there will be judgment. Did our life lead us to heaven? Their life lead us to hell. And so it's important to consider the fact that once we die, there is no other chances. We don't have another second chance at life after we die to get it right. So, how we live now determines how we will spend eternity. And the Lord Jesus loves us so much that he talks often about heaven in the scriptures, but also talks a lot about hell and eternal separation from him because he loves us. And we might question what, in fact, is hell. Hell is eternal separation for the souls that have pushed, pushed God out of their lives on earth, pushed away God, pushed away prayer, pushed away mercy, pushed away repentance of sin, that all those no's in this life become translated into an eternal no in hell. Why would God, a merciful God, we would say and raise hands, let any soul go to hell? Because that's what the soul wants. Because if you want a life without God, if God and angels and saints and holiness are a source of consternation and unhappiness and resentment, then heaven will be absolute misery for the heart that does not love the Lord. How will we be judged? On the basis of our love. St. John of the Cross says, in the evening of life, we will all be judged on our love. A few Sundays ago, Jesus told us the greatest commandment of all, 
Sum it up, Lord. What do we do? How do we live? You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength and your neighbor as yourself. There it is. That will be how we are judged when we die. Can that be said about us? Did we live this way? That is the judgment. So the Lord, in his love for us and giving us a free will, the ability to choose to love or not to love, to choose to receive mercy and forgiveness or not to, in our free will, God respects our decision even with its eternal consequences. And so look around the world. There are plenty of people who are most certainly pushing God out of their lives, most certainly standing up against the Lord and all of his goodness. And in fact, we play along too. In fact, every time we sin, we're practicing for hell. Why? Because all sin is no to God. No to God, his plan, his life, his commandments. Hell is an eternal no. And so the Lord wants us to be in heaven, which is the source of all true joy and happiness, free of all suffering, in communion with him, in the fire of his love like we've never experienced before. And the saints are the ones who lived on earth seeking heaven. They thought about their death regularly. They knew they would all be judged And they wanted to be there filled with love at the moment of their death. Filled with the love of God, which transformed them. Heaven. The souls in purgatory are going to go to heaven. It's a good time to think about what purgatory's role is. Purgatory is God's fire of love burning away the impurities of our lives. If we die in the state of friendship with our Lord, but not perfectly, totally given over to him, the Lord allows more time for this purification, this time where the fire of God's God's love is painful, but so that we can be ready for heaven to receive all of God's love totally purified. Every soul in purgatory is heaven-bound. But the souls in purgatory are helpless, And that's why during the month of November, we pray for the souls of the faithful departed because they need our prayers. Purgatory is a place where you cannot pray for yourself ever. You're totally dependent on your loved ones and the church on earth praying for you, offering masses and rosaries and other sacrifices to help you along the way, to get you to your final resting place in the heavenly homeland where those souls so much desire to be. This month of November, then, my brothers and sisters, these four last things, these four certainties that can face souls are a good time for us to reflect where we are in our relationship with Jesus. And the whole point of discipleship is to be heaven-bound, to be totally transformed by the love of Jesus in this life, to be with him forever in the next. The ancient author, the ancient Roman author Seneca has these words to say, it is not that we have so little time, but that we have wasted much of it. It's not that we have so little time, but that we have wasted much of it. So our time, such as it is, my brothers and sisters, is all gift. And when we live our lives detaching ourselves from possessions, and yes, even our time, so that we are living for Jesus and not ourselves. Then the road to heaven is bright and glorious for us. We find ourselves wandering off the path. We can return so easily to our Heavenly Father through the sacrament of reconciliation to recognize that, no, it's not my time. It's yours, O Lord. And we can say with the prayers of the church at the Easter Vigil when the Paschal candle is blessed, Christ, yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, all time belongs to him. To him be glory and power through every age and forever. Amen.